Welcome to HealthCast, the heartbeat of health IT. I'm Alexander Bolova, production lead at GovSkyO Media and Research. With me today is senior researcher, Sarah Cyber. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Alex. You had the opportunity to chat with Mickey Tripathi, National Coordinator for Health IT. How'd it go? It was great. Mickey is a repeat interviewee on our podcast series, so I always love chatting with him. We dove into a lot of the new projects that ONC is working on, and there have been a lot since the beginning of the year, so it was great to catch up with him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I want to pause because you said we. I believe that there was another person who joined you for this podcast, even if they weren't on mic. Yes, Jayla Whitfield. She's our new staff writer and researcher with GovCIO Media and Research. Uh, She joined the call. I think it might have been her first podcast, but she was shadowing me. So she was off mic. And I think Mickey made a reference to her in the episode. So that's who Jayla is when he says Jayla. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I can't wait to hear Jayla when she hosts her own podcast. So to set the stage, what is the 21st Century Cures Act? I believe that played a big role in your conversation. Yes. So the 21st Century Cures Act kind of sets the foundation for all of the work that ONC does. It was signed into law in 2016, and it seeks to increase choice and access for patients and providers. So it provides provisions to streamline the development and delivery of drugs and medical devices, accelerate research into illnesses, address the opioid crisis, and improve mental health services. The act also aims to ease regulatory burdens associated with the use of the electronic health record systems and health information technology. This is primarily where ONC comes into play. So the act contains provisions on advancing interoperability, buzzword, but that is like what ONC does, (laughs) and requiring developers not to engage in information blocking or preventing or interfering with access, exchange, or use of electronic health information. So that has been the foundation, the reason for many of the projects that ONC has done. Right. And speaking of those new projects, Since the beginning of the year, ONC has announced several. Could you give us an overview of those? Yes. So this is going to be an early alphabet soup. So Mickey and I talked a lot about different projects, and they're all acronyms. (laughs) So to start off, we have the USCDI, which is the United States Core for Data Interoperability. It's a standardized set of health data classes and data elements for nationwide interoperable health information exchange. And then TEFCA, the Trusted Exchange Framework Common Agreement, basically the overall goal of TEFCA is to establish a universal floor for interoperability across the country. Interoperability, again, I think that is the word of this episode. (laughs) So the agreement will establish the infrastructure model and governing approach for users in different networks to securely share basic clinical information with each other. And Mickey uses a great analogy for this. And then finally, we have HTI-1, the Health Data Technology and Interoperability uh, Certification Program Updates Algorithm Transparency and Information Sharing. (laughs) Was that a mouthful? (laughs) What was, was that what that one acronym stood for? Yep. It is a new proposed rule. So should I say it one more time? <laughs> say, say it one more time uh, for those who couldn't catch it the first time. OK, so HTI one is a new proposed rule from ONC, and it stands for the Health Data Technology and Interoperability Rule. And then it's a colon. Certification Program Updates, Algorithm Transparency, and Information Sharing. (laughs) Only in the federal government. (laughs) Yes. So you can see why they call it HTI-1. But the rule basically addresses data standards and development, defining and setting guidelines around trustworthy AI, and reporting requirements for certified healthcare IT. 
Yeah. And speaking of AI, which is, you know, the hot topic of the moment, how does the new guidance approach artificial intelligence? Yeah, so Tripathi and I will dive into this, but basically HTI-1 specifically mentions AI, but it's not meant to regulate a given vendor's AI or the vendor system that uses AI. It's more so meant to provide a list of ingredients to the AI that's used in a given system to increase transparency when government uses these different platforms. Wait, wait. A a list of ingredients, that sounds an awful lot like a software bill of materials to me. I would say so. (laughs) Wow, look at these different tech topics connecting from across the universe. That's right. There's so much innovation, but now I think uh, we're taking a step back to try to increase transparency around it. So I think we're going to see a lot of technology ingredients, lists of these ingredients, recipes (laughs) um, to better display what's in the technology. Well, with all of that in mind, let's take a listen to your conversation. So ONC's HTI-1 proposed rule announced in April includes updated standards, implementation specifications, and certification criteria. Could you provide an overview of the rule and discuss the next steps? Sure. There's, um, uh, you know, it's a it's a big rule. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. you know, something like 500 plus pages. You may have noted. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, there's a lot in there, but, um, but, uh, you know, we think that, uh, it's got it just a number of things that are incredibly important for our healthcare system and for the digital foundation that we're all working on creating to, you know, be able to improve, uh, people's lives. So, um, let me just go through, I can go through a couple of, you know, kind of big things and then, um, and then, you know, happy to dive in further um, in, er- in any area of uh, particular interest. So there's a number of things related to uh, to standards. Uh, so, you know, ONC does a number of things. We work on standards. We work on um, encouraging uh, uh, people to, um, uh, you know, to share information. And we um, do a number of other things related to, um, you know, certification of systems as well. All of those, you know, things working, you know, sort of uh, uh, together to complement each other. So in the area of standards, an important element of the digital foundation that we've all been, you know, working toward over the last decade of implementing electronic health records is to um, have you know kind of a minimum data set or a standard data set that we can all count on in these EHR systems, so that wherever you are in the country, uh, you know whether it's Nome, Alaska, or Sarasota, Florida, or Austin, Texas, um, you know you know that that EHR system will at least have that minimum data in a standardized manner, so that you know if you if if it's needed for you know emergency care purposes or for other purposes that everyone can count on that. Um, and that in in um, in ONC, that's a standard that ONC defines called the US CDI, the US Core Data for Interoperability. And up right now, up until this rule, we were on uh, you know sort of US CDI version one, which mm-hmm. is you know sort of a standard that you know that we had promulgated really like three years ago, I think, um, as the first version of that. That has a number of elements in it, but we we are um, proposing to update that to version three and. A number of things that are in that that I think are important to um, you know to all of us are that version three has really important data related to social terms of health and health equity. It uh, you know for example it has uh, uh, four social determinants of health categories. It's got tribal affiliation. It has uh, sexual orientation, gender identity data elements. Um, it has insurance information that wasn't included um, beforehand because we know that basic insurance information is a really important part of of, uh, of health equity. So that's you know one thing that we do is we sort of incrementally update the that minimum data that um, mm-hmm. organizations are required to support. The other thing in the way of standards is we further bolster the fire um, standard that's required to be supported by electronic health records. As 
um, as you may know, you know, we in previous roles have required that all EHR vendors support this FIRE API, this open industry standard, non-proprietary standard for exchanging information using modern internet approaches. So you can have like an app on a mobile device, be able to collect, connect with an EHR system. Um, so that's already, you know, a requirement that went into effect fully on December 31st, 2022. But there's certain things that we want to do to update that. Um, and so that's, you know, the rule has those kinds of elements as, as well in the standards. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll just take up a couple of other things and I'll pause here. Um, so, you know, so in the standards, it's, it's, you've got those things. We've got a whole set of things um, that are uh, statutory requirement related to um, reporting on what our EHR systems doing and what they're, what are they capable of? And that came from the 21st Century Cures Act. It's um, the EHR reporting program. That uh, that we that we've you know sort of given the brand name insights, and that has in the in the rule we have a set of um, proposals. I think of nine kinds of um, data that EHR vendors, certified EHR vendors, are required to report on, and those are things like you know like how many interoperability exchanges have you been doing in different kinds of ways? How much data you know? How many times have you made data available to patients? I think what the Congress was getting at there is well we've spend a lot of time and money on EHR systems. We know that some stuff is happening, but it would be good to, for us to be able to have some real data so that an EHR vendor can, you know, can export data on what kind of activity is happening, how much to patients, how much to other providers. So that's the insights condition. It's the first set of EHR reporting requirements that um, you know that we've uh, that we've put out uh, as a part of uh, as a part of our program, and then the last thing I'll just point to is uh, I'll point to two things. One is is uh, we also have our information blocking rules that also went into effect in a prior rule, but we're further you know sort of tweaking those and adjusting those according to what we're seeing in the market as being you know kind of market issues. We want to make sure that the information blocking rule is is as clear. As it can be, and um, and as oriented toward the goal, which is making information exchange easier among authorized parties. And so we have a number of proposals in there that are related to saying everyone should be encouraged to use standards-based approaches for exchanging information. Everyone should be encouraged to use TEFCA if they are participants in TEFCA, um, which I know we'll get to uh, if they're going to be exchanging information. So those are the kinds of things on the information blocking front. And then the last thing I'll point to. Is um, is AI the um, the the uh, draft rule has a set of proposals in it related to uh, transparency on what AI systems, which we call predictive decision support interventions, but it's basically algorithms and AI based approaches. There's other approaches that would fall under the category of predictive decision support initiatives um, interventions. So that's why we have that broader term, but you know, AI is hot right now in people's minds. So I wanna make sure <laughs> I point to that. And um, and so what it does is that we're not regulating AI. We're we're not we're not telling you know Epic Cerner, Athena Health, you know, any vendors or any providers that they should or shouldn't use AI-based approaches um, to uh, you know to in, in their EHRs. But what we are doing is saying that if it's in there, um, there ought to be a, a standardized way to make the information available to the um, to the customer, to the user, like the provider, for example, so that they know what algorithm is, is incorporated or embedded in that system. And they can decide appropriately whether they want to use um, you know, that algorithm for their particular patient population. So it's you know, very much with an eye towards saying, you know, we, we just want to have transparency um, about those algorithms. We don't, we're not regulating the algorithms per se. We're just, you know, saying that, you know, that everyone should ought to have like a nutrition label um, mm -hmm. is kind of the analogy that people like to use on the algorithm so that the user knows, you know, if there are any known risks, for example, or where was the data, you know, that was used to train that algorithm? Um, you know, where did that come from? So anyway, as I said, a lot of things in the rule, but hopefully that gives you a sense of some of the big things. Yeah, that was a great overview. And as you mentioned, it's been a huge year with AI and ONC specifically with HTI1, TEFCA. I know you're making progress with USCDI too. So as you alluded to, ONC recognized six qualified health information networks for working to create a nationwide interoperability network under the 21st Century Cures Act in February. So for listeners that are getting up to speed with ONC's TEFCA, could you give us a brief background on on what it is and what it means for the future of interoperability? Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, imagine a world where 
where wireless networks, just you know, our regular wireless networks, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, imagine a world where those networks weren't fully connected with each other. So, you know, Sarah, you might be on Verizon, Jayla, you're on, um, uh, you're on AT&T, and I'm on T-Mobile. And let's say, you know, T-Mobile and Verizon don't connect at all. So it'd be like, oh, Sarah, you and I can't talk because I'm on T-Mobile, you're on Verizon. And Jayla, well, we can talk, but we can't text because AT&T and Verizon have that kind of arrangement, right? And so that's, right. and so you can imagine, right? Well, I mean, it seems silly, right? Just even to say it, but what most people don't recognize is there have been a set of agreements, <laughs> technical <laughs> specifications that connect those wireless networks in the background so that when you go to Best Buy to buy your phone, you don't worry about, well, wait a minute, is this is this one going to connect to, <laughs> you know, to my mother who's on a different network? Or you never even think about that. That's actually what we want interoperability networks in healthcare to be able to do. Right now, there are a number of networks. Some of them are state or regional networks, like in Indiana, they have the Indiana Health Information Exchange. Um, in Maryland, they have CRISP which is an acronym whose full name I can't remember, um, but that, you know, that's, a, that's a health information exchange in Maryland and it you know, covers DC and a couple of other states. And then there are a few nationwide networks like Care Quality and Commonwealth and the Health Exchange. And they kind of connect, like the nationwide ones kind of connect, but it's not perfect and it's not sort of seamless or invisible to the user. Like the user still experiences you know, this, oh, I'm on this network, they're on that network, so we can't fully exchange with each other. And, you know, and what a pain. Um, mm -hmm. And why, why do I have to figure that out? TEPCA is designed to solve that problem, to say, you know what? We ought to have the network. So it's about network to network interoperability. Say all these networks should agree to a common contract. So we're not negotiating, you know, spending all this time with lawyers negotiating, you know, um, uh, weird variations of, you know, who can do what with whom. We all say, let's have a single set of terms and conditions that everyone agrees to so you don't have any mystery around it. And then a common set of technical specifications so that everyone can exchange um, authorized information with each other using open industry, non-proprietary standards. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of TEFCA is to say, let's get us to that point so that no one has to think about network interoperability anymore. And again, going back to what I was saying before, if you're in Nome, Alaska or Sarasota, Florida, it's just connected in your EHR. And if you need to, you know, if one of your patients from Florida happens to be on a trip up in Alaska and they end up in the emergency room, they can just query your system via network and get it back and not even think about it. That's, you know, that's what we're aiming for. And that's what TEFCA is designed to support. You know, on February 13th, we announced six organizations who have agreed voluntarily to implement the TEFCA network. So that means they're agreeing to, um, to the common agreement, which is the common contract and they're agreeing to implement the technical specifications and to go live with that before the end of this calendar year. Um, and those, those, um, those QHINs, as we call them, Qualified Health Information Networks, once they're fully designated, meaning that they've gone through the implementation process, that, that means that, you know, that in theory, they could cover you know, the majority of hospitals and ambulatory providers in the country today, uh, you know, knowing who they are, like Epic, Commonwealth Health Alliance, eHealth Exchange, other networks that are among those six who have stepped forward and said they're going to do this. So it's a really huge, huge, huge moment for interoperability in the country. And, um, and we're really excited about you know, their commitment to implementing before the end of this calendar year. And, um, and there are other networks in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the pipeline. So those aren't the only six. Those are just the first six. And we have a number of others that we hope to be able to announce relatively soon. Right. That's super exciting. And I love the analogy of the different cell phone networks. That's totally what it is. And it, you know, it makes much more sense to just have everyone connected. Right. Uh, and and the other thing is, you know, for patients, I don't know if, you know, just to just to bring it to healthcare here for a second, mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know, if you've had to, you know, um log on to a patient portal um, mm -hmm. you know, for for any in any care that you've gotten. Um, one of the one of the challenges that people face is that you know, every single provider, like, you know, a typical Medicare member has something like 11 different providers. And, um, and, and that means that they, you know, in theory could have like 11 different portals <laughs> that they have to log into, which makes it a challenge for them to be able to get all their information. That's leaving, leaving aside, you know, their, their uh, Blue Cross portal, let's say, or their Blue Button portal where they get their Medicare data. Um, and what, that's one of the things, one of the other things that TEFCA is designed to um, address, which is the ability for a patient to be able to just have one login and they can get all of their records, regardless of where they are, and be able to bring them back in through that one login. 
Yeah, that would be great. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you continue to build it out. So what are some of the benefits of TEFCA? Like where could you see impacts across the federal landscape with cancer care or emergency response, et cetera? Sure. Yeah, there's a number of things that, you know, once 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 it, it really picks up steam and, you know, mm-hmm. starts to get that um that wide penetration, which, you know, which will take it'll take a couple of years, right? They're all gonna go live this year. And then it'll take, you know, it'll take a, a couple of years for them, you know, to get all of their participants, you know, um, on there and using it. That's always the other thing is that you can, you know, you can have things that are available. That doesn't mean people use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we just, you know, we recently had an experience with my mother who, uh, you know, who unfortunately broke her hip and we were in a hospital and we had to go to another hospital, rehab hospital. I know those two hospitals are connected on a, at a network on the back end. I know they are for a fact. Mm-hmm. Um, but the frontline staff still fax stuff. Like wow. they still, they were still printing it out and handing it to me and saying, here, take this to the next provider and they will scan it into their system. And you're just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, got, you guys, I know you're connected on the back end, but your frontline staff are still faxing and still printing. So I think, you know, we're always going to have that challenge where we have to say, all right, how do we make sure that everyone knows? But to your, you know, specifically your point, what are the what are the incremental values that TEFCO will be able to provide for some of these key, na- you know, national priorities? Um, let's talk about uh, uh, incident response. One of the things that TEFCO is directly addressing is public health, to say that public health entities ought to be ought to be connected directly to this network so that they can exchange information with providers, exchange and exchange information with each other as well as exchange information with the CDC. You know, there's kind of almost three different patterns there. The data that comes to a state public health agency comes from provider organizations through EHRs. And right now they build custom interfaces, you know, for every one of those, and they do it state by state. So you've got Texas building interfaces to different Epic sites, and then Oklahoma right next door, building their own interfaces to Epic sites in their state. And then Arkansas, right next door, building their own interface, right? I mean, it's just, it's it's crazy. It really is like a crazy system. And then you also have the problem that Texas, let's just take this example again, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas don't have the ability, the public health agencies, though they have full authority, right? They're the ones who have the authority in our country. They don't have the ability to exchange information with each other for people who cross lines, right? For people who cross the borders, which is, again, crazy. Right now, they do it via fax phone, email, that's how, that, that's, that's how they're exchanging information with each other rather than saying they should just be on a secure network. So right. they exchange information with each other. So anyway, that's one of the benefits that TEFCO will provide the public health community is having them directly connected securely so they can exchange information. The other um, you know, real benefit, I think I've already talked about the individual access one, is payers. So having payers directly participate in, um, in, in TEFCO-based exchange is, you know, right now, payers, which is health insurers, they need clinical information to be able to support um, payment. So often, you know, a a claim will come to a, you know, to a payer. And then for some of them, they just flow right through and that's fine. Um, Mm -hmm. For others, they need additional information, either like it's part of a prior auth. So there's a whole prior auth kind of workflow that they have to go through, or it's just, I need additional information. It's not necessarily prior off, but you know, for other reasons, I need like an, an, an additional clinical information to be able to support that claim. Right now, the way that happens is a huge tax, a huge hidden tax on our system because each health insurer is working with providers to like get that fax to them, have paper copies sent to them, their phone, they're calling via phone. And if you're a provider, right, you're working with like 30 different provide, 30 different health insurers, and you're getting all these calls. You just, just you used to have staff devoted to fielding these requests from health insurers, right? Again, mm-hmm. like totally insane <laughs> kind of system that we have today. The ability to just say, you know what? You're both sides, you're just connected to a secure network. You can just automate this stuff and exchange information securely on the back end and not have to build all these custom approaches, not have to devote people to doing it, and most importantly, get answers to people so that patients can actually get the, you know, get the care that they need and not be sitting around waiting for days for all this stuff to be processed before they get the care that they need. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And people that 
don't work in health IT, like my family members, for example, when I say, oh yeah, like this is still running on paper or faxing or phone calls. It's shocking that we're in 2023 and that's still how it's run. So totally. it's exciting that you are pushing this new wave and getting everyone up to speed. So you mentioned in your previous answer, moving information securely. So how is ONC approaching data security as it continues to make progress with TEFCA? The, uh, you know, TEFCA has built into it the, you know, the kinds of uh, security protocols that all of us are very used to in when we do banking, for example, which we do mm -hmm. a gazillion times a day, <laughs> you know, everything that you do with banks, for example, it's the same basic technical protocols and technical approach that is used by other industries and is used in healthcare as well. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. It's just that when, as we talk about a nationwide network now, we're saying that those, those same protocols are what's being established. And um, these QHINs, these Qualified Health Information Networks, they're required to, um, uh, to have those security requirements, both from a technical perspective, as well as from a policy perspective and a staff perspective. So we made sure to focus on all three to say there's some technical specifications that you're required to, to hit, no compromises on those. There are some policies that you're required to have in place um, as it relates to security. And then there are, you know, there, there's a requirement, for example, that each of them has a person dedicated to security, a chief security officer. We made that an explicit part of the requirement that they that they have that person designated and fully dedicated to um, managing security at, at, um, in the networks. So um, that's just an example of the kinds of things that we're building in um, as a part of, you know, sort of the TEFCA agreement. And what we think that does is that um, establishes a firm floor for security across the country for organizations that participate. Because, you know, right now, the way it happens is, you know, you just have providers who are just connecting with each other. They kind of tried to sort of, you know, vet each other's approach. But frankly, at the end of the day, there's only so much one hospital can do about, you know, vetting the security protocols used by another hospital, right? You know, right. they do, or used by a network. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they, they do what they can. But what this does is it just kind of ups the ante for everyone and says, all of you are agreeing to this, you know, to this agreement, and all of you are agreeing to implement a certain set of protocols to be able to, you know, to have that exchange. And you're making explicit requirements on these QHINs, these networks, to actually drive that and to enforce it. Where, again, right now in our country, we don't have anything like that. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love what you said about creating a floor uh, with those standards. So do you anticipate benefits to health equity as more organizations adopt TEFCA standards? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, in, in a couple of ways. One is, and, you know, it does, it's not going to solve health equity overnight, but I think that if you think about some of the gaps that we have from a health equity perspective, that's, you know, one of the motivators for us, you know, um, uh, aggressively moving forward with TEFCA. One of the things about the private sector networks that, you know, that operate today is that something like 30% of, of hospitals across the country don't participate in those networks, even though they're up and running and they, they actually do a great job um, of exchanging information among providers for treatment purposes. So Care Equality, um, which is kind of an umbrella network that tries to connect up other networks, they, you know, they do something like 50 million transactions per day. So it's a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. that's more than like the SWIFT Global Banking Network does 40 mil 41 million per day. So for anyone who thinks, oh, we don't have, you know, why can't we be like the banking sector? Well, it turns out that care quality does more <laughs> transactions per day than the SWIFT global banking network. So we have uh -huh. a bunch of interoperability. It just isn't uniform across the country. And it's and it's got some gaps and some holes. And that's what TEFCA is, you know, is, is uh, designed to provide to say, hey, the private sector has done a ton, but there are some things the private sector can't do on its own. And it's now time for the public and the private sector to work together to say, how do we fill in those gaps? Let's build on what the private sector has done. So one of those gaps is something like 30% of hospitals don't participate in networks today. And we think that the primary reason is that they don't have the resources. And those resources might be technical resources. They just don't have you know, the ability to pay for that latest upgrade of their EHR system, or they aren't able to buy an EHR system that is fully capable of that kind of interoperability, or they don't have the technical expertise. They just you know, don't have the ability to have a full dedicated IT staff, for example, to be able to you know, manage that network connection and figure out how to do it. And we think that most of those hospitals are um, underserved or serving underserved populations, probably in rural areas, as well as in, in inner city areas. 
So that's you know one area that we want to be able to say, if we can shine a light on that and make that a priority of network exchange, and then from a federal government perspective, think about what are the different levers that we can pull in the federal government to be able to get that 30% so that they can get connected, then you know that'll have a huge health equity impact, we think, because all those patients don't have the benefit of that today. The right. other thing I think is that you know as we have exchange based on those standards that I was talking about before, that USCDI version version three, mm -hmm. um, which is you know what was in the proposed rule, that's what EHR vendors will be required to support. And so then, if they're connected to Net to Tefka, which is you know which is uh, what what what's going on here, then they'll sort of automatically then raise the floor on the interoperability information that's exchanged, and we'll have a greater assurance that we have that health equity related data exchange, like that SDOH data and the SOGI data that I was talking about. Um, and uh, and so TEFCA, by saying that USCDI version three is going to be the standard that's exchanged, now you've, again, sort of raised the floor and said, all right, everyone now has the assurance that I've got a network that'll allow that exchange. Um, I've got organizations who didn't have the ability to be connected, now be connected, and that the information that, that's uh, really important from a health equity perspective is, is now being exchanged. Right. That's great to hear. And there's a ton in the pipeline. So it's really awesome to watch how you all are moving these different priorities forward. So looking ahead, what are some of the next steps for health IT and what trends should we keep an eye on? Well, certainly, you know, certainly TEFCA um, is, mm -hmm. you know, is one really important one. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're just getting started here. We actually haven't gone live yet, even, you know, for all mm -hmm. the excitement. It just takes a lot of work to build, you know, all of the policy and the technical approach to be able to say, all right, now, now let's go. So that's, you know, that's, that's one important dimension. The other, I think, is the, um, is the approach to algorithms and AI, which is, you know, which is a key and, and really important, um, you know, sort of dimension here that uh, has gained a lot of momentum, as we know, over the next, over the last couple of months. So, you know, so I think that's something that's uh, of obvious concern to everyone, as it should be, uh, because, uh, you know, because we need to be able to make sure that, those algorithms that are incorporated in the EHRs are doing what the provider thinks that it's doing. All right? At the end of the day, mm -hmm. that's what we just want to make sure that it's an effective um, tool for the provider to be able to make the decision that they're going to make about their patient. Um, and the patients have some visibility into that as well. Um, the other the other areas that I would point to is, um, is, is certainly the growing dimensions of, uh, of public health. And as we start to say, how do we have more and more public health directly connected to providers so that they can give information back to providers um, using you know, modern network conventions and um, have a better ability to even connect with patients directly so that patients can get their own immunization information, for example, um, in much easier ways than they're able to get today um, and be able to share lab results or other information directly with public health uh, you know, is, a, I think, another area that uh, could be important. And then the last thing is, is just the um, the API economy that we're pushing really hard on. Uh, I think is a, is an important thing that individuals, uh, you know, will hopefully start to see the benefits of, uh, you know, relatively soon. And what I mean by that is the idea of you know every EHR vendor and with CM with our partners at CMS who provide the motivation for providers to implement that um, is just having an open API that allows an individual to access their information um, in the same way that they can access their information um, you know, in any other way, like using a banking app, for example. The idea is they ought to be able to just have a healthcare app like the Apple Health Record or Common Health or you know, a number of others that are out there um, and a growing list that we wanna be able to say, this is actually creating the, you know, sort of the fertile ground for that innovation. Mm -hmm. Because once you've made that information available via non-proprietary ways, then individuals have the opportunity, as well as other organizations, you know, care management organizations, other service providers that can start to step in and say, hey, we can take that data on behalf of a patient and we can combine it with other things that the patient has asked us to combine it with and provide a novel set of nervous uh, services to them. And it even expands our notion of, you know, what is healthcare? Right. We're right now like the only way you the only the, the only times that most of us um, who are relatively healthy interact via, you know, sort of digital uh, means like with a patient portal or something else is when you're actually in the healthcare delivery system. Right. You're either going mm -hmm. in for a physical or you have something, some healthcare need 
that means I have to be in a hospital, I have to be in a doctor's office, whatever it is. But how, we, how about if we expanded all of this to think about, you know, wellness in general and health in general, not just healthcare, but health in general, you start to see it be more of a spectrum that's like, well, I have information that's shared when I'm seeing a doctor for sure, but some of that information can be combined with other information that are a part of other parts of my life, like my Fitbit information or like my over-the-counter purchases or whatever it is with my permission. And you can imagine different services sort of saying, hey, we can take that data. We can use advanced techniques, AI, sure, other techniques to be able to you know, provide you back with information that might be really you know, important and interesting to you about managing your own health, your sleep cycles, your other kinds of you know, information that your doctor doesn't typically you know, have or interact with you with, but you know, other services you know, can develop um, and uh, hopefully with your permission, uh, be able to provide those services back to you in ways that are more meaningful in your day-to-day life. So right. I know it seems really ambitious, but that's what we're trying to do is create that fertile ground to allow that kind of innovation to occur. No, it's super exciting. I think this is a huge time of change for the better for healthcare. Uh, and I'm looking forward to watching how you all implement these projects and it improves my life as a patient. So thank you for all the work that you are doing. And thank you for joining me today to uh, talk more about it. Great. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Sarah. That was a great conversation. Before we let our listeners go, are there any last takeaways or highlights that you want to leave them with? Yes, I feel like this is my takeaway for a lot of the conversations I have on our podcast series, but there really is a ton of change in healthcare right now. And with the boom of AI and with all of these innovative technologies, I think there's going to be a big focus on, you know, increasing transparency around that and making sure the different technologies and data are interoperable. So we'll see as patients of United States healthcare services, (laughs) a big change in the way that we interact with providers in the very near future. Very exciting changes on the horizon. Thank you so much, Sarah. For more coverage of everything healthcare and technology, make sure that you're subscribed to HealthCast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a review if you'd like. And if you have a recipe you want to share, uh, sure, why not share those as well? We'll be back next week with a brand new HealthCast. But until then, I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Sarah Seibert. Thank you for listening. HealthCast, along with GovCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com.